I want you to imagine for a moment that somebody told you that they could guarantee you eternal life. I think the first question that I would ask such a person would be, what exactly do you mean by eternal life? What kind of everlasting life? Advances in medical science mean that we are able to keep people alive longer and longer. Maybe science will get us to the point one day where we could extend life indefinitely. Is that what we mean by eternal life? Let me say I've spent enough time in hospital intensive care units and in nursing homes and in palliative care units seeing people kept alive at the brink of death to realise that living on forever like this, that wouldn't be heaven, that would actually be hell, wouldn't it? But what if I could guarantee you or somebody could guarantee you eternal life that was in new perfect bodies? It seems to me that so much of our energies these days go into trying to make fitter and younger and better versions of ourselves. As each birthday rolls around, however, I look at myself and I realise it's not working. No matter what I do, I get older, I get slower, and I know it's only, it's only a downhill slide from here. And I don't know you well enough, but I suspect the same is true for you. But what if we could have new bodies that would never wear out? eternally in the prime of life, what, whatever that was for you. That would be pretty good, wouldn't it? But even then, that wouldn't be perfect if we were still living in this fallen, broken world, this world full of violence and injustice and greed and pain. Sometimes I think it's hard enough to cope with one lifetime full of heartache and tragedy, but can you imagine having to store up the heartache and tragedy of, I don't know, the last thousand years of human history? Can you imagine having lived through and experiencing the crushing weight of human misery for all of that time and living with that for all eternity? But what if eternal life was not in our broken bodies and it wasn't in this broken world, but it was in a new world, a world that was no longer crippled by sin and its effects? And not only in a world free from sin, but we ourselves free from sin and its effects. Think of all the broken relationships in our lives, the broken relationships because of the things that we have done wrong, relationships with others, indeed our relationship with God. Imagine a world where all of that was put right. Well, that is what is on offer when God speaks about eternal life. Eternal life lived in complete harmony with himself and others in a perfect world. That is what Easter is all about. That's why today is the single most important day for the Christian. Because it's the resurrection of Jesus that guarantees that kind of a perfect future. Without the resurrection of Jesus, there is no Christianity to speak of. Now, I know that some people think that you can have a version of Christianity without resurrection, a, ver a version of Christianity which is just, I'll try and live like Jesus lived. I'll, I'll try and live a life of love and forgiveness and compassion and self-sacrifice. Now, that's not a bad thing, but let me say that, that's not Christianity. Let me say very clearly, Christianity without the resurrection of Jesus is no Christianity at all. And I'm not just saying that. That's what Paul says in our passage this morning. In verse 19, Paul says, If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people more to be pitied. Paul's point is that everything turns on the resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, our faith is, verse 14, useless. He says, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. If there's nothing beyond this life, if there is no hope beyond the grave, well, you may as well make the most of the short time that you have available. Of course, Paul is saying that that's not the case. There is, in fact, a life after this life. And the resurrection of Jesus is what opens the door for us. This morning I want to focus on why the resurrection of Jesus makes such a difference to the future. Paul makes two simple points in 1 Corinthians 15 and they're the two simple points I want to focus on this morning. Firstly, that Jesus' resurrection means the end of sin and death. And secondly, that Jesus' resurrection begins the beginning of 
life eternal. They're the two ideas. Jesus is the end of sin and death. Jesus' resurrection means the beginning of eternal life. At the end of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of sin is death. But God gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Really, the, the argument of the whole chapter is a very simple one, that our victory over death and sin only comes because of Jesus' victory over death and sin. At the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul summarises what he calls the gospel, the good news about Jesus, the, the, pre, the message that he preached to the church at Corinth and elsewhere. And he says this, What I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. What is this gospel message? It, it is that Christ died for our sin. Before his death, Jesus told his disciples exactly that, that he was going up to Jerusalem, that he was going to be handed over to the Jewish leaders. They were going to beat him, mock him, nail him to a cross, and he was going to suffer and die for the sins of humanity. Jesus told his disciples that he would give his life as a ransom for many. And the heart of the Christian gospel is that, that that's what happened on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he took the punishment that I deserve, that Matt deserves, that you deserve. Now, I guess anybody could make that kind of a claim. I could tell you, hey, I'm going to die for you. I'm going to hurl myself off, off a building and that's going to pay for your sins. Anybody could make a claim like that. But... If, if I made a claim like that, that would just be an empty claim. How would you ever know whether I was able to do that? And Paul's point is, in verse 17, the, the resurrection of Jesus proves that his claim that he could die for our sins was not an empty claim. He says, verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. If Christ says, I'm going to die to pay the ransom price for your sins, but he remained dead, then the logical conclusion is that he wasn't able to pay the price. The resurrection of Christ proves that the price has been paid. It's been paid in full, that there's no longer any debt outstanding. There's no longer any problem with sin that keeps us from God, that our sins have been fully and completely dealt with. The resurrection then is the guarantee that our sins have been forgiven. But get this, says Paul, because it's not just that the resurrection of Jesus is like a big rubber stamp that stamps paid in full over, over, this, over the record of our sins. The resurrection of Jesus is the thing that actually begins to break the power of sin and death over us. The resurrection of Jesus is what will ultimately lead to the end of death itself. As Paul says in verse 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Now, Paul explains how this is all going to work out at the end of the chapter in verses 55 and 56. He asks rhetorically, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. Now, Stay with me, this takes a little bit of, of unpacking, but what Paul is doing here is explaining the relationship between God's law and sin and death. Ever since the first sin of human beings, ever since Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden broke God's law, death is unavoidable because we all sin. We all sin because we don't want to submit to God's law. Back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were told, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God said to them, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Adam and Eve, they rejected God's word. They took the fruit. They ate of it. They fell under that sentence of death. And Paul's point is that for every human being ever since that point, we've all lived under that same sentence. You will surely die. Death 
has the last word for all of us in this life. And Paul is saying that is the result of our sin because our sin means that we transgress God's law. The law says you're guilty. That says you are going to die. You must surely die. That's, that's the pattern of human existence. But, says Paul, the resurrection of Jesus changes all of that. For the Christian, death is no longer the last word. Death no longer has that kind of victory over us. For the Christian, says Paul, death is, is a little like a, a bee with the stinger that's been plucked out. I, I've been bitten by bees enough times to know that I don't like that. But I do know that once a bee has lost its stinger, it, there's nothing that it can do to me that I need to worry about. And death is like that for the Christian. Because what gave death its real power over me was not the, the fear of the physical act of dying, but the fear of what comes after death. The fear that God's perfect holy standard is up here and I know that I have fallen well short of that mark, that one day after my death I'm going to stand in the presence of God and God's law is going to condemn me for falling short of that mark and that makes me afraid. Afraid to be in the presence of a holy God when I know that I'm not a holy person. But, says Paul, for the Christian it's completely different because we know that Jesus died for our sins. And so when we stand in the presence of God, we're not afraid because we fear the, the judgment of God. Death, eternal death, condemnation from God is no longer the inevitable consequence of our sin. The resurrection of Jesus proves to us that God is not an angry judge up there waiting to throw the book at us, but rather that he is the loving father who is waiting to throw his arms around us. So when our sins are forgiven in Jesus, we know that God will welcome us into his family as a precious son and daughter. That eternal uh, life facing God in the afterlife is nothing to fear, but something to look forward to. This is the first instalment of eternal life. Eternal life, if you are a Christian, has actually already started. Eternal life has already begun the moment you turn back to God and, and put your trust in Jesus. Because at that moment, we now enter into new restored relationships. Our broken relationship with God is now restored. God is beginning to restore our broken relationships with one another. The resurrection of Jesus means the end of sin. It means the end of the judgment of death. It means the end of the fear of death. And says Paul, the best is yet to come because what is still yet to come is the end of death itself. And so Paul's second big idea in this passage is that the resurrection of Jesus is the beginning of everlasting life for all who follow him. Paul says that the resurrection of Jesus, the past resurrection of Jesus, is the guarantee of a future resurrection for us. He says, verse 20, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. What are, what are these firstfruits that Paul is talking about? The firstfruits were the first part of a harvest that was offered up to God in thanksgiving and in anticipation of the full harvest yet to come. So if you're a farmer, the very first fruits of the crops, whether it's the, the stuff off the trees or the, stuff, the, the grain that you're harvesting, you would take that and you would offer it up to God, uh, knowing that there, this was just like the, the first taste of what was going to come as the rest of the crop uh, became ripe and you would be able to, to harvest it. And Paul is using this here as a metaphor. Just as the first fruits of the harvest prefigure the rest of the harvest, to come, so too is the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus is just the first part of a much bigger harvest yet to come. Or to put it another way, the fact that Jesus has been raised from the dead guarantees that the Christian will be raised from the dead. And let me tell you, we need to have that kind of a guarantee because in the rest of my experience, I've never seen anyone raised from the dead. I do lots of funerals. And let me tell you, 
I would be freaked out if halfway through a funeral somebody got back up out of the coffin. I'm not expecting resurrection from the dead. On Easter Day, the disciples were not expecting resurrection from the dead. The very last thing that they thought was that Jesus was going to come out of the tomb on the third day, even though he had told them that that was going to happen. Because in their experience, in your experience, in my experience, dead people don't raise from the, come, dead people don't come back to life. But God did something truly spectacular, truly Really amazing on Easter Day so that we would know about resurrection life, that it is actually possible for dead human beings to be brought back to life. He demonstrated that by the resurrection of Jesus. The fact of the resurrection of Jesus guarantees that God can raise us. Just as God raised Jesus, he will raise us also. And I want to emphasize that because Jesus was raised bodily. That is, right now in heaven, Jesus has hands and feet, and he has a mouth, and he has a head, and he has hair. He's a, he's a human being. Yes, a glorified, risen, exalted human being, but the risen Jesus looks much like he looked as he walked on this earth. And so too with us. When we're talking about eternal life, resurrection life, that is what we are looking forward to. Many people have a view of heaven that has nothing to do with Christianity. It actually comes from Greek philosophy. Many people think that when a person dies, there's this split between our material body, which just kind of slowly dissolves into dust, and the immortal soul, which forever lives on in some kind of disembodied state floating through the universe. In short, our bodies turn to dust and our souls go to heaven. That's Greek philosophy, that's not Christianity. That's not what happened to Jesus. Jesus was not and is not a disembodied soul wafting aimlessly on the clouds of heaven. Jesus has a resurrection body. The gospel accounts of the resurrection stress that. For example, in Luke's Gospel, Jesus says to his disciples, Look, see here, my hands and my feet. It is I. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when they still weren't convinced, Jesus took a piece of fish and he ate it in their presence to prove that he was bodily resurrected from the grave. Jesus held out his, on, in another account, John's Gospel, Jesus held out his hand to Thomas, who was not unconvinced at this point and he said put your finger here see my hands reach out your hand and put it into my side he's trying to assure his disciples that he had a real human body Jesus resurrection body was a tangible touchable physical body and what is true for Jesus will also be true for every Christian believer Jesus is not offering us a eternity in disembodied souls. Jesus is going to give us eternal life in eternal bodies, in an eternal place of heaven. These bodies will be both like and unlike the bodies that we have now. They will be like enough that we can be physically recognised for who we are, just as Jesus was able to be physically recognised by his disciples. And yet, it, in the same way, our bodies will be transformed bodies because they will not like, be like the body that I've got now, which is a body that is wearing out and, and getting slower and weaker. I, I, um, I have a thing called a frozen shoulder at the moment, and I realised as, as we went to, to, to demonstrate during the kids' song about uh, God opening arms, his wide uh, opening arm, opening wide heaven's gate. I went to open, I thought, I, I can't open heaven's gate anymore. It's just a reminder that my body is, is slowly wearing out. When I get to heaven, I won't have a frozen, frozen shoulder anymore. What Jesus offered is eternal bodies, which will be fit for all eternity in a new creation, a new heaven and a new earth. For us, Everything turns on the resurrection of Jesus. His bodily resurrection is a foretaste, or as Paul says, a first fruits of our resurrection to come. That is why Easter Day is so important for you if you are a Christian. Because, why? Because it is the end of sin and death. It is the beginning of life everlasting. 
As I close, I want you to ask yourself, do you want this kind of eternal life? Do you already know that you have this kind of eternal life? Eternal life that doesn't just begin when you die, eternal life that's already started because you've already entered into that restored relationship with God. You already know that God is not the angry judge waiting to throw the book at you, but the loving Father who has already thrown his arms around you. That you already don't have the fear of dying because you know that death is not a terrible gateway to judgment, but a wonderful gateway to eternal life. That you know that your relationship with God is not lived under the sentence, you will surely die. But rather, you've already heard God's words to you, I forgive you. If you don't yet know this, let me encourage you to take out those response cards that are in the pew and particularly tick the box on the back that says, I want to know more about this or I want to go do Christianity Explored. Christianity Explored is a great way to, to understand what the Bible is offering. Uh, Matt would love to talk to you more. I would love to talk to you more about this. So whatever you do, don't walk out from here this morning thinking, yes, I want that eternal life, but I'm not going to do anything about it. Please do something about it. Talk to Matt, talk to me, uh, take out that card, tick the box. Uh, whatever you do, uh, grab hold of what is on offer this morning. The resurrection of Jesus cannot be a matter of indifference for any of us. Negatively, if the resurrection of Jesus didn't happen, then let me say Christianity is futile. Christianity is a fraud. Christianity is a hopeless delusion and you may as well just pack up and go home if the resurrection of Jesus never happened. And if, if that's your problem, if you think that Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, that, that's an entirely another different conversation. In fact, that's an entirely another sermon, which I'm not going to do right now. If that is your issue, though, again, come and talk to me later. I'd love to give you a book, uh, two different books, uh, one called Who Moved the Stone by a guy called Frank Morrison. Uh, he was a, a lawyer, who, not a Christian, who set out to disprove Christianity, and he asked the question, who moved the stone? He assumed that somebody had moved the stone and taken the body of Jesus around, and as he uh, had taken it away... As he looked at all the alternatives, he came to the conclusion the only thing that made sense of all the facts is that Jesus rose from the dead and the non-Christian became a Christian. Another book was a guy, uh, written by a guy called Lee Strobel, an investigative uh, journalist called The Case for Easter. He looked at uh, the evidences and he looked at the evidence of uh, the friends of Jesus, the witnesses. Then he said, well, maybe that's biased. So he looked at the evidence of the enemies of Jesus, the non-Christians uh, of, of, of the first century. And then he looked at the evidence of history. And again, he, although starting out as a non-Christian, again, eventually came to the same conclusion Conclusion. Actually, the only thing that makes sense of the evidence of the friends, the evidence of the enemies, the evidence of history is that Jesus rose from the dead. So if, if that's your problem and you don't think that Jesus rose, uh, come, again, talk, talk to me later, different, uh, different conversation. But if you do think, yeah, I'm convinced that Jesus rose from the dead and the fact that Christians have been celebrating this for 2,000 years, there's a reason for that, but I'm, but I'm not going to do anything about it. That's crazy. Because the resurrection of Jesus means the end of sin and death. It me means the beginning of eternal life. And it means the beginning of an offer to you of eternal life. Please do something about this today. The resurrection of Jesus changes everything because his resurrection day is a foretaste of a day yet to come. And when that day comes, I want you to be there with me as we together gather around the throne, as we begin an eternity together in perfect relationships with God, with one another, in a restored creation. Jesus brings us life everlasting, the life that we were always meant for. What Adam and Eve were made for in the beginning is what Jesus is offering us for the end. That is surely something to get excited about. So let us go out into this day, into Resurrection Day, echoing Paul's words in 1 Corinthians. Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the resurrection of Jesus. We thank you that we are no longer left in our sins because Jesus' death has broken the power of sin over us. We thank you that we are no longer left in uncertainty because the resurrection of Jesus testifies to us about the life to come. And Father, we thank you that the resurrection of Jesus opens the gate for us to have eternal life with you. Father, we pray that you would help us grasp, grasp hold of this hope that you have given us and praise you for all eternity in Jesus name. Amen.